Okay, we, um, this particular message is sort of a pause between Romans 10 and Romans 11. And the reason I'm doing that is to really talk about how does Israel fit into the last days. And I think by doing so, it'll be easier for, for us to understand Romans 11. So it is part of the Romans series, but it's not like we're going through any of the passages in Romans. I'll be kind of looking at a lot of other passages. Also, just want to kind of mention that, um, depending on when you happen to listen to this, we are in the midst of 21 days of prayer for Israel. We started on October 30th, so you can kind of do the math there. And not just for Israel, but everything that's happening in the Middle East. And sometimes people kind of ask me, you know, well, you know, why Israel? Why not other places? Aren't we supposed to be praying for other places? Yes, of course. But there is something unique about Israel. And hopefully, by the end of this particular um, uh, session, you'll understand more about why Israel is, a, is and should be a special focus for us. Okay, well, one thing, we're in the midst of, you know, this war between Israel and Gaza, we're not sure about these other countries, or are they going to be jumping in? And, and really, the Middle East, Israel, is flaming up like it really hasn't for at least 50 years, perhaps even more. You know, the uh, biggest single massacre of Jews since the Holocaust was on October 7th. So, th this is a very pertinent topic for us to talk about, you know, just what does God say about the Middle East? Now, there's going to be a lot of things I'm going to leave out because I just don't have time in one session to do that. And, uh, and I'm not going to go through lots of verses for everything I say. But I think I hope to at least kind of give a brief outline of some of the major things that need to happen as it pertains to Israel. Okay, just kind of a kind of give the context, Romans 9 through 11, uh, we see Paul uh, very interested in prayer and intercession for Israel. And again, when we talk about Israel, we're talking about the people, not just the country. Sometimes it does apply to the country, but more often than not, it's talking about just the Jewish people. I say that because in Romans, when Romans was written and, it, and it's referred to Israel, there was no Israel, not as a country. Uh, so in Romans 9 through 11, we see that Paul has this intense prayer for the Jew, for his Jewish kinsmen. You know, he knows that many of them have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And he acknowledges they don't deserve God's mercy. But it also points out that, you know, it's kind of like us. You know, we don't deserve God's mercy either. But God is still going to do something with Israel. Uh, in the grand scheme of things. Romans 11, which we'll start next session, uh, gives us a beautiful picture of what God wants to do with the church and the Jewish nation of Israel. Again, when I say nation, the people. Uh, and we're going to see how God is going to pull together a lot of his purposes uh, in, you know, in Romans. And a lot of these things are kind of unfolding before before us right now, you know, in Romans 11. So anyway, so today, a scripture overview of the last days as they pertain to Israel. Um, and I think by doing so, we could better understand Romans 11. So let's start with Matthew 24, because it's really the most complete chapter that talks about the end days. In fact, it starts off, and it's not just Matthew 24, but it's Matthew 24 and 25, those two chapters are really an answer that Jesus gives to his disciples because they're sitting up on the Mount of Olives and they're asking him privately, it says, tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming? When's going to be the end of the age? And he goes on in verse four, he says, see to it that no one misleads you. And he says, there's going to be a lot of people trying to deceive you about the end times. And while we've we've certainly seen that, and he talks about you know there'll be wars and rumors of wars and but that's not quite the end. The nation's going to rise up against nation. There's going to be famines and earthquakes, but that's not quite the end. These are just the birth, uh, 
uh, pains. He says, you know, people are going to betray one another. People's law, um, people's love is going to turn cold, but that's still not the end. But it's getting closer. He's going to talk about there's going to be false prophets. And then in verse 14, he mentions a very key event. He says in verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations or all the peoples of the world, and then the end will come. So we know one of the two key signs that are going to try to that that, that point it to the to the you know that are most important one is the gospel is going to be preached to all the nations and then comes the end the other one is found a little bit later in matthew 24 and let me kind of read it verse 32 through 34 now learn the parable from the fig tree when its branches already become tender and put forth its leaves you know that summer is near so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So here, Jesus, he doesn't give us the hour. He doesn't give us the day. He doesn't give the year. But he does, does narrow it down to the generation. And it's found in the parable of the fig tree. Now the fig tree represents the nation or people of Israel. If we had time, I'd kind of go back and show you in the Old Testament where over and over and over the fig tree represents the Jewish people. And actually, just really a few chapters before, uh, remember Jesus is with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and they see a fig tree, and uh, it's not bearing fruit. And what does Jesus do? He, he curses it and says, you know, because you're not bearing fruit, you'll never bear fruit again. And, um, and again, there is a message behind that. And so, uh, but he says that when the fig tree, when the branches become tender and put forth its leaves, in other words, when it begins to have life, you know that summer is near. And he, and he says, and when you see these things, meaning the fig tree putting on life, you'll know that he is right at the door and that that generation will not pass away, you know into all these things take place. So I know back in 1948, many Christians thought, well, Israel is becoming a nation or a country uh, for the first time in almost 2,000 years. This is what it's talking about. And in fact, uh, there was uh, a lot of talk about, well, biblically, a generation seems to be about 40 years. And so uh, a lot of people kind of pegged, well, 1948, add 40, 1988, Actually, I remember a book being uh, being published, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. And of course, we know that that didn't happen. And I think now we see and we understand that uh, it's not, the tree isn't just the country itself, but it's more the life, the spiritual life. And starting in the 1970s, and then especially in the last 15 years, there's been an explosion of growth of Jewish believers, Messianic believers, sometimes they're referred to, people, Jews who are coming to know Jesus and uh, in great numbers. So I think that's probably really what it's referring to, not necessarily that Israel became a country. That was obviously very important, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But both of these two, the gospel being preached to all the nations and the fig tree beginning to have life again. Uh, both of those two, I think an argument can be made uh, that this is really the first generation since Jesus has, um, you know, since he ascended to heaven, that these things are happening. And I know a lot of times people talk about signs of the Antichrist or this or that or earthquakes and those are, those are, I'm not saying that those aren't important, but these are the two most important signs. And we are there, brothers and sisters. So anyway, let me, let me just kind of give an overview of some other things that need to happen, and some of which is already happening. First of all, it's very clear in the scriptures, Jews will return to the land that God, uh, given to them by God. In 70 AD, the Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed. 
by 130 AD, almost all the Jews who were living in the area of Judea, Samaria, had been scattered among the nations of the world. And uh, there are many passages here uh, that talk about this. Let me just kind of mention a couple. Let's, let's start with Isaiah 11, 11 through 12. And um, probably should have had these kind of already tabbed here. But anyway, it says, Isaiah 11, 11 through 12. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord, by the way, when Isaiah mentions that day, it's always referring to kind of the very last days. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathos, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And notice he says he's going to do it a second time. That's because he already did it once when the Jews were taken into captivity in the Babylonian captivity. We read about that in, you know, uh, the end of Second Kings, you know, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther are taken take place during or right after the uh, captivity and tell the story of their return. But he said it's going to happen again. And, and the promise here, he's going to bring them all back. Okay, or not all, but he's going to bring back a remnant. I think that's probably a very important distinction. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 20 is another place, starting in verse 41, 42. For on my holy mountain, on the high mountain of Israel, declares the Lord God, there the whole house of Israel, all of them will serve me in the land that I will accept. Ooh, I'm sorry here. I think I have missed Ezekiel 20, 41. Okay, okay, maybe it is. Okay, okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, as a soothing, verse 41, as a soothing offer, off, aroma, sorry about that, I'll accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered, and I'll prove myself holy among you in the sight of the nations. And you will know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the land which I swore to give to your forefathers. So this is another place. And this this is repeated many, many times. I mean, one person told me, or I, or I read once, that uh, there are actually over a hundred places where it talks about that God's going to bring back his scattered people back to the land that God had given them. And, uh, and of course, we know it really started at the beginning of the 20th century. By 1948, Israel becomes a country again. Jews from around the world begin to come back to their ancestral homeland. Uh, actually, Hebrew, which had been sort of a lost language for the most part, except for uh, among rabbis is restored as the official language. 1967, Jerusalem becomes the capital once in it, again. Uh, and, and we've already kind of said this, but in the 70s, Jews start coming to know Jesus. But people have come from, you know, it started off, Jews were kind of coming from, you know, Eastern Europe, Russia, then other places of the Middle East where they had been for, you know, centuries and centuries. United States, Canada, Latin America, Western Europe, France, and it's it's been something it's been something that's been happening ever since. So this is something that is happening. Not all for sure, but certainly a remnant. Okay. Another thing that is we know from the scriptures, the first one is that Jews will return, or many of them, to the land that God was had given them. The second thing is there will be a great revival among the Jews worldwide. Okay, we already kind of saw that with the parable of the fig tree, you know, in Matthew 24. We've talked a lot about this already, so I don't want to, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, spend too much time on it. But Zechariah chapter 8, just kind of give you a few more passages that talk about this, starting verse 3, going through maybe verse 8. 
Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem. Each man with his staff in his hand because of age. And the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Is it too difficult in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days? Will it also be too di difficult in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts? Now again, the reference is to a remnant, not everyone. Verse 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am going to save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the rest, west, and I will bring them back we just already talked about this, and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. This is where they are really turning to the Lord. You know, verse 13, same chapter, Zechariah 8, and it will come about that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you so that you may become a blessing. Do not fear. Let your heart, hands be strong. And then verse 20 through 23, same chapter. Thus says the Lord of hosts, it will yet be that peoples will come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one will go to another saying, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will also go. So many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those day days, ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Okay, I could give a lot more, but I think it's something that, um, you know, I think we've already been convinced of. We're going to see it more in Romans 11 next week. But, uh, you know, I think I have a chart here just talking about worldwide. Just to give you an idea, in the 1950s, there were a couple thousand Jewish believers in Jesus or Yeshua. Now, I, these figures, you know, no one's actually counted them. There's a lot of secret believers. These are estimates by credible Jewish, uh, you know, um, you know, messianic ministries who are working among Jews worldwide. A couple thousand. By 2015, it was estimated half a million. And then by 2023, actually just last month in September, you know, they're now saying maybe a million. In fact, they, they, they said not a million. It, there are a million Jewish believers. That's out of like 15, 16 million. This is growing exponentially. And within the country of Israel, gone from about 200 to about 20,000 to now about 50,000. This is expon exponential growth among the Jewish population of people coming to know Yeshua. So when it talks about there being a great revival, among the Jews worldwide, yes, it's happening. Okay, that's another point that's very important. There'll also be a great revival among the other Middle Eastern countries. And this is very important. A lot of people don't really see this. Uh, if we go back to Genesis 17, and remember that Abraham actually had another son too, right? What was his name? Ishmael. And uh, and in Genesis 17, we uh, and this is just one verse. I could probably point out several others too. But in verse 20, it says, As for Ishmael, this is the Lord speaking, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him, and I will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. That means like abundantly. He shall become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. Actually, the... Uh, is talking about the Arab nations and even some of the other Middle Eastern peoples there. But my covenant I'll establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will, bore, will bear to you at this season next year. So this is something that, you know, at the very beginning, God said, I haven't forgotten about Ishmael. 
I've got something special for him. You know, you know, down the road, he's going to be blessed as well. Isaiah 19. And this is, I think, a key passage here, really starting in verse 19 to the rest of the chapter. This isn't hard to understand. It says, in that day, and of course, that day meaning there at the end, there'll be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near its border. It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a champion, and he will deliver them. Savior, champion, who's that? Jesus, of course. Thus the Lord will make himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. They will even worship with sacrifice and offering, and will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. The Lord will strike Egypt, striking but healing, so that they will return to the Lord, and he will respond to them and will heal them. Amazing. But then it goes on. It says, in that day, again, that day, the last days, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrians will come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria. And the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be, a th will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. Whom the Lord of hosts is blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel my inheritance. This is God's picture, the overall picture there. Now you might say, well, uh, wh wh where is Assyria? It's not even a country yet. No, it's not. But the old Assyrian empire included Syria, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, a major part of Turkey, the um, Arabian Peninsula, Egypt. Well, Egypt, of course, but at that time, much of Northern Africa. You might say, well, that's, that's kind of the whole Middle East. Exactly. And, and, uh, and I think we could probably say, especially the Arabs, you know, the other descendants of Abraham, God's going to pour his spirit out. And there's going to be a worshiping together of the peoples of the Middle East. That is God's greater plan. And it's beginning to happen today. Revival is breaking out in a lot of these countries. I know you don't see that on the news, but in Iran, for example, they, for about the last five or six years, the church has been growing fastest in the world in Iran. And it's growing second, you know, exploding. The second place that it's exploding is um, in Syria, especially among the Syrian refugees. It's also happening in Egypt now and other places too. But what God said was going to happen, it's happening. And it's happening before us right now here in the 21st century. We need to open our eyes to this. So there's going to be revival among the Jewish people. There's going to be revival among the other Middle Eastern countries. And actually, there's going to be revival worldwide. So in Israel, the Middle East, along that Isaiah 19 highway, as people call it, and throughout the world. And uh, of course, we've already seen in Matthew 24 that the gospel is going to be preached to all the nations. There's going to be a great harvest. And there's many, many other places. Let me just kind of mention one. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After these things I looked, behold, a great multitude which no one could count. From every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. Yes, we live in exciting days because these things are happening today in the world. And Christians need to begin to, as Jesus instructed us, open our eyes and look at the harvest. Things are happening now. And how does this war that's going on fit into it? I'm not sure, but God is stirring up things. He's causing people to be frustrated, maybe at their leaders, frustrated at the lack of peace, 
and they are looking for answers. And the church needs to be ready to share the gospel with agape love. And actually, that's probably the last thing I want to kind of mention here is the church is central in what God will be doing. And how should we be responding? Well, we need to be responding. We need to respond with a renewed zeal to preach the good news because it's only the good news that can, pe can set people free from hatred and suspicion and bitterness. And by the way, the, uh, um, you know, even the last few weeks, I've been in some Zoom prayer meetings with leaders uh, of churches and congregations in Israel also among the Palestinians and some of these other areas. And you know what? There is a unity. Now, I'm sure Satan wants to try to rock this unity, but there's a unity going on right now, and we need to see that. So we need to respond with a zeal, a greater zeal than ever, to preach the good news around the world. We also need to respond with that incredible Christian love because he's filled our hearts. We have access to agape love that will fill our hearts. And for people, even loving our enemies and our persecutors, you know, uh, John 13, verse 34 and 35, you know, where uh, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I've loved you, that you also love one another. That's that's pretty strong love that we love one another as Jesus loved us. And then he goes on and says, by this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. It's happening. And then I think the third thing we, that we need to do as the church, we have to respond in powerful prayer. We need to take our praying and our intercession to a new level. It's not an option. We've got to do that. Listen, the church, the bride of Christ, is making herself ready. For what? The coming of the bridegroom. We have been destined to reign with Christ forever and ever, starting in this next age. And one of the things that's happening, and we're going to see this next week, there's a merging together of two streams of what God's been doing in history. First of all, the messianic part of the church and also the Gentile part of the church, he's making us, as Ephesians 2 says, into one new man. It's happening. So anyway, with this war in Israel, we need to be giving ourselves to prayer and intercession. These 21 days of prayer for Israel, uh, that's just to help us get started. That's not the end of it for sure. We need to realize that this war is extremely complicated. Just in U.S. history, if you study it, many U.S. presidents have dreamed of trying to bring peace to the Middle East. None of them have been successful. Jimmy Carter, perhaps, but not anything that's really lasting peace. Because you know what? Without the Prince of Peace, Jesus, Yeshua, there will be no true peace. In fact, I believe that God has probably designed the Middle East in such a way that there are no real answers. The only answer is Jesus, Yeshua, to come and fill people with the peace that surpasses all understanding, the peace that kind of only comes through knowing him personally. So these are some of the things that I think are happening in the world today, some of the things that have been very clearly spoken have to happen. And these are things that we see are happening. So again, that Jews are going to be going back after being scattered for almost 2,000 years to their homeland. Revival taking place among the Jewish people or worldwide. In fact, there's also revival taking place among the other Middle Eastern nations and revival taking place around the world and the church rising up to what it's what she's been called to be